Greetings. Good. I don't know where you are, if it's day or evening. Where I am, it is later in the evening as I want to have this video completed. And uh, tomorrow is uh, um, the Lord's Day. And I'll be repeating this, this message in, in uh, excuse me while I grab my pen, uh, in, in front of all the, the church here at Redwater. And for all you Canadians, I'd just like to take this time to uh, wish you all a happy Canada Day. I hope you had a chance to celebrate uh, the, the country that we have been placed in by God himself. And um, so I just want to start by uh, uh, um, saying uh, thank you for having me in your places. And I would, do, I would covet your prayers um, for Redwater Church and for myself. And uh, I just thank you so much for that, that um, unity that we can have in the body of Christ when we pray for each other. So this past week I found an interesting website called top10s.net. And that's Z, of course, top10s with a Z.net. And even a more interesting blog on that website called The 10 Most Fa Famous Feuds in History. Top10s.net defines a feud as, quote, an extended argument between two groups of people usually started as a result of an insult, violence, or even murder. And of course, we look past over history and we find many blood feuds and they seem to have been commonplace events. And even some of those historical blood feuds uh, would escalate beyond individual families or groups that were involved and unfortunately and silently led to greater conflict uh, wherever this was located. I just thought of one, uh, the War of the Roses, ran, ran for about 32 years. That began with a, um, uh, you know, a feud amongst groups, a few groups, and it expanded. But when it comes to family vendettas, the feud between the Hatfield and McCoys has indeed become legendary. You may have heard of it. You may have heard of it in a popular song or something like that. But it's a historical example for us of the trail of suffering and death a vendetta can produce. So the differences between the wealthy Hatfields from West Virginia and the working class McCoys from Kentucky uh, began during the American Civil War. The Hatfields were pro-Confederate and they didn't hide their malice or scorn for the McCoys who supported the Union. But it wasn't until 1878 that the feud escalated into an all vendetta on both sides. And it was over a dispute concerning the ownership of a pig, which ended with the McCoys killing one of the Hatfields. And from then on, both sides regularly began killing and kidnapping and beating one another. There was one particular time that uh, Rosanna McCoy became romantically involved with one of the Hatfields. And the strain of this relationship eventually led to a series of brutal murders on both sides. So back and forth, forth and back, this continued, this bloody feud continued until it reached its high point in 1888. And what would become known as the New Year's Night Massacre. And this is where the Hatfields attacked a residence uh, cabin of the McCoys, resulting in the death of the two children and the brutal building of their mother, a brutal beating building, pardon me, of their mother and the destruction of their home by fire. So this incident and all the string of murders that were happening in the 1880s resulted in the authorities becoming involved. So the governors of both West Virginia and Kentucky deployed their militia to get some sort of control in this bloody feud between the Hatfield and McCoys. Years have come, of course, and gone, and despite that bitter violence and hatred between these two families, it seems that the descendants of the Hatfields and McCoys today have been able to maintain a peaceful truth. Well, another fellow by the name of Tom Rayner as a result of an unscientific survey on Twitter, provided a blog uh, 
giving his readers in that blog 25 silly things church members fight over. For example, and we share some of them with you, there's once was this dispute in a church but, uh, because the Lord's Supper had cran grape juice instead of grape juice. Another, dis- another one that happened was a petition was, uh, was uh, produced to have all the church staff clean shaven. I guess that would mean me as well if it was in our church. There was a big church argument over the discovery that the budget was a dime short. That's true. That's what uh, one of the responders said to Mr. Rayner. But someone finally gave a dime to settle the issue, and uh, I think there's bigger problems than a dime in that church. And one more, and then no more. There was this deacon accusing another deacon of sending an anonymous letter and deciding to settle this dispute in the parking lot, if you get my gist. Well, the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Please turn in your Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll be uh, concluding this chapter today, starting with verse 14 to the end of chapter 3. You can join me, please. Verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this uh, passage that we're looking at. We ask that you would help us by your spirit to understand and the depth of it, the, the meaning behind it, the implication of this for our own lives. And may we not only understand it, but may we walk it out with our uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, with our neighbors, with our communities, with our countries that we live in. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Apostle Paul, at the beginning of his letter, states... Uh, with precision, with clarity, that he was writing who he was writing to. Listen, I'm really having a hard time with my words today, so I don't know what's going on. Let me start over. The Apostle Paul, at the beginning of his letter, states with precision who he was writing to while he was in a Roman prison. We see this in in chapter 1, verse 1, where Paul said, to the saints who are in Ephesus. To the saints who are in Ephesus. So when we began our study, at the very beginning, we learned that the word saints, as translated in the ESV that I'm using, or transliterated hagios, in the original Greek, means separate from, dedicated, sanctified, consecrated to God. So Paul was writing to the dedicated and sanctified and consecrated to God in the ancient city of Ephesus, who Paul said were faithful in Christ Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 1. My friends, it was all about Jesus when it came to the church at Ephesus. It's all about Jesus. Paul reminded the Ephesian church, as he reminds you and me today, that it is in the hearing the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, chapter 1, verse 13, that created the church at Ephesus, that created the church in the world around us. Paul, in the first half of his letter, details the work of Christ in the hearts of people who are one time at odds with each other and certainly at odds with God, to put it mildly. Yet Paul had made it crystal clear clear in chapter 2 that at one time all were dead in their trespasses and sins. 
They were all following the course of this world, just as we were before Christ saved us. And then Paul would say, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. And this was by the means of grace through faith alone. Chapter 2, verse 8. You see, my friends, do a little study of the first century church. You see that they were faced with some major issues as it began to grow and expand beyond the gates of Jerusalem after Pentecost. And Paul deals with the question that many Jewish Christians of his day were asking. What are we going to do with the Gentile Christians? How do we become a hagio? Hagios. How do we become a church when Jew and Gentiles are miles apart culturally, uh, miles apart linguistically, socially, politically, and religiously, and maybe other things as well? I just want to paraphrase how Paul would respond to this. Well, now you are one in Christ. Chapter 2, verse 11 to 22, we find Paul's theological response to these questions and concerns. Paul summarized in chapter 3, verse 6, as we mentioned last week, these, his response to their concerns. This mystery that is now revealed in Christ is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. She wants the Jews and Gentiles were miles apart. Now because of the Gospels, they've been brought together as one people, as one new society in Christ. Yes, cultural differences would continue. Diversity, my friends, is not and will not be the issue. Where one is born is not the issue. What language one speaks is not the issue. What one eats for breakfast is not the issue. Because why? Because the believer has been brought near by the blood of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 13. And they were, back so long ago in Ephesus, and we are now no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Chapter 2, verse 19. And Paul reminded the Ephesians, as he reminds us today, that the foundation of the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. That is, it's in him that the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple, a place where the dwelling place for God will reside by his spirit, chapter 2, verse 20 to 22. So with this in mind, now we can turn to the text today and find a familiar phrase before us in verse 14 for this reason. Remember back in chapter 1, Paul began his prayer of thanksgiving with, with this phrase, for this reason. At the beginning of chapter 3, Paul began with the same phrase, but then changed course for his own reasons. And we discovered that last week, where Paul then exhorted regarding the mystery of the gospel. And now, satisfied with his exhortation or his parenthetical uh, uh, statements, paragraphs there, Paul said here in verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Well, there's a couple of things we need to look at here. First, we need to recognize that this phrase, for this reason, brings everything that Paul had said in chapter 1 and 2 up to this point together into his prayer for the saints at Ephesus. That's the first thing. Second thing, with no time really to explain it in depth here, please notice with me when Paul said, I bow my knees before the Father. Now, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you would know that, that Paul was a man of prayer. He prayed lots. Take some time reading through the Acts and his letters, you will see what I mean. But here's the point. The physical posture when we pray was not for Paul, nor should it be for us as important as the inward attitude of our hearts when we pray. That's what God is interested in, is the attitude of our hearts. 
Because you see, Paul knew who he was praying to. He was praying to the Father. Remember when Jesus was asked by one of his disciples to teach us to pray what he said? He said, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. In other words, Father, holy be your name. Holy be your name. Luke 11, 1 and 2. My dear ones, remember who you are praying to when you pray and remember the attitude of your heart when you pray. You're not praying to Santa Claus or the genie in the lamp. You're praying to the Father. Third thing, notice verse 15. 15. There's that tongue twister again with my mouth today. Notice verse 15. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. This is very interesting. Paul reminds his readers here that God is the one and only creator. And by the word of his mouth... Uh, named, as one commentator put it, every conceivable grouping, human or non-human. All owe their very existence to the creator of every family. Well, moving into verse 16, we must ask this question. What was Paul praying that God could do, would do for the church at Ephesus? And the answer is found in the content of Paul's prayer beginning with verse 16. Let's read that together. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's verse 16. Now there's a couple of things we need to look at here. So bear with me. One, first thing, Paul prayed that God would grant the Ephesians to be strengthened with power. The question is, what is this power that Paul prays? the Ephesians would receive. This word power is the transliterated dynamis, which is our, becomes our English word dynamite. So what is this power? Is it the power like we see in the hyper-charismatic movement or hyper-Pentecostal movement? That kind of power that they always proclaim they have from God by a spirit, new revelation and all that sort of stuff. Or is it that power that the New Agers proclaim and talk about? What kind of power is Paul praying for the Ephesians to receive? Well, my friends, the context and the meaning in the original sense really informs us to take this phrase in this way. This phrase, strengthened with power, to mean strengthened by degree. Strengthened by degree. Or as the King James Version, or in the RSV, translate the original, to be strengthened with might or strengthened mightily. And this is a clear translation which reflects what Paul said to the Philippians in that letter when he said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We need to remember that the emphasis in Paul's letter is the centrality of Christ and what Christ does in an individual and in the church. And it was because of Christ that Paul could do all things through him. For him, that is Christ, Paul would say, strengthens me. Well, my friends, this brings us to our context and in our place in the church and in the culture. And it brings up a challenging question for you and me to ask ourselves. Where do we go to find strength in life? You know, children, as they're growing up, turn to their parents for the strength and support they need. But where do grown-ups find the strength they need in life? Life itself, absolutely, can build strength and resilience in a person, and even in a group. Our personal relationships can be sources of strength. But, and we can't miss the obvious. The local church should be a place where folks can find support and strength in life. Let me ask you, where did Jesus find strength to carry on his way to the cross? What about the great cloud of witnesses the writer to the Hebrews points to? Where did they find their strength to run with endurance? The race set before them. I think we all know the answer, don't we? But do we, like Paul, bow our knees before the Father and pray to the Father for strength? Or do we pull up our bootstraps and do this life in our own strength? These are questions that are provocative and challenging. And I pray we spend some time considering those in our own lives and in our churches. Some number of things that are happening here. 
Four things. First one, Paul prayed that God would grant the Ephesian church increasing strength. Increasing strength. Secondly, what is the source out of which the answer to Paul's prayer would come? We find it in the first half of verse 16. That according to the riches of his glory. Whose glory? God's glory. Thirdly, who is the agent by which this increasing strength would come from? Again, verse 16, second half, through his Holy Spirit. Fourth, and finally, what was the location, or as one commentator, sphere that the increasing power would reside? 16b again, in your inner being. So I just say that we may join with Uriah Hallman, who penned the words long ago from an old hymn, and say with him, God is my strength over hilltop and mountains. God is my strength in every affliction. Moving on to verse 17, we see it begins with a conjunction, so that, or we could just have that, depending on your translation. Here is Paul's great desire for the church, my friends. Why Paul prayed for increasing strength for the believers at Ephesus. That Christ may dwell in your hearts. That Christ may dwell in your hearts. And always through faith alone would Christ dwell in our hearts. And it's out of that indwelling presence of, of, of Christ that Paul now uses two metaphors to describe what happens. What it is to be filled with the full, all the fullness of God. Verse 19. First, he prayed that you being rooted and grounded in love. And here we have a botanical metaphor. Rooted and grounded. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that will produce something in a believer. If you are a believer and you have the Holy Spirit and you are obedient to the Word of God and you are following Christ, something is going to be produced in you. For Jesus said to his disciples, and it implies us as well today, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. John 15, 16. Remember when Jesus spoke a word of warning against false prophets during his Sermon on the Mount, where he said, you will recognize them by their fruit. Matthew 7, 16. And he went on to say that healthy trees will bear, what? Good fruit, but diseased trees will bear bad fruit. Paul, in his Galatian letter, letter, speaks of the works of the flesh in contrast to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22. Check that out. My friends, one who tends for the garden of his heart, one who is rooted and grounded in Christ, will produce the fruit of the Spirit. And in this case, the spiritual fruit that Paul highlighted, or I should say the component of the spiritual fruit that Paul highlights is love. Secondly, Paul prayed that the Ephesians would have what? The strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Verse 18. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like another metaphor. This is an architectural metaphor. And, I, and one has to ask, how can one really fully understand the love that Paul is addressing here in his prayer? How can one understand that? The breadth and length and height and depth. How can one really know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge? Verse 16, verse 19. And it seems that this was Paul's intent here. He was, he, he was pushing the boundaries of our finite minds. Of the Ephesians, and ours today I mean. Uh, to make the Ephesians, to make us dig deep into our very soul, to challenge the believers in Ephesus and us today to consider the richness and vastness of Christ's love. And more than consider the immensity of Christ's love, but to pursue Christ's love in every way possible and in every area of our lives. How? How can one do this? Exactly. One cannot do this on their own. That's Paul's point. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. Notice the phrase, with all the saints, with all the hagios, verse 18. 
Paul was not praying for some individual here. He was praying that the church in Ephesus would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. My friends, it is the Christ's love that produces a people rooted and grounded in love. I have a question for you. How do you love people you don't like? How do you love people you don't like? Greg Morris for DesiringGod.org in one of his articles asked the same, very same question. He wondered how one can obey God's call to love others when one can't stand the others. Well, there's another ta- time in another place. I would often meet with a brother and lord for breakfast or for some other sort of event. He participated in our men's group. I should say we participated in the same Bible study group. We attended church together. We shared common interests. We spent time together. I consider, I consider him a friend and brother in the Lord to this day. But I want to tell you this. He had a habit of complaining about pretty much everything. From social issues, political issues, church issues, from the color of his breakfast toast. And he was easily offended. There were times I was absolutely exhausted after our time together. Again, another time, another place, we had a neighbor that was, let's let's just say, very difficult to be right next door to. How was I to respond to these two two difficult relationships? See, Morris was right. Quote, he said, God calls his people to love the hard to like, requiring no reciprocation. But we ask the genuine question, how? We know that Jesus commanded you and me, love your neighbor as yourself, Luke 10, 27. He went even farther when he said, commanded, I should say, love your enemies and do good and lend, expect, and lend expecting nothing in return, Luke 6, 35. But how, Lord, you might be asking, how, Lord? Paul here in his text points to the way forward with this difficult, difficult question. Not all saints are easy to love. Isn't that true? Not all saints are easy to love. So the church needs to be rooted and grounded in love. That's the priority. My friends, a church that prays for strength, that Christ may dwell in our hearts of faith, faith is a church that can love the unlovable and even the enemy. Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, makes it even more clear in this regard. Paul said, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all this, put on love, put on love, like a coat which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. My friends, in our own strength, we cannot do that. By ourselves, on our couches on a Sunday morning, we cannot do that. No, my friends, it's in the community, it's in the new society, it's with all the saints together that we can begin to learn how to be grounded and rooted in love. And God is more than able, as the scripture tells us here in verse 20, he is more than able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. So we can say together, as we close now, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for helping me as I mumble and fumble and stumble through this message for whatever reason. But I know, Lord, what your word promises is that it will go out and return. Not void, but accomplishing exactly what it was to accomplish. And I pray that. I pray for each person listening to this. Pray, God, that you would bless them. That they would know the love (laughs) that surpasses all knowledge that they would pursue it with all their strength, that they would share that love of Christ with the unlovable in their lives, with the hard to get along with in their lives, and even the enemies in their lives. 
and watch how you, by your power, can change everything. I thank you, Lord, for this. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Shalom.